Welcome to this YSL Excel VBA tutorial. In this part of our series on writing SQL for Excel files, we're going to look at how to create basic calculated columns. We'll start with a quick look at how to add a column to a select list and how to use an alias to easily identify the value you've calculated. We'll go over some basic arithmetic and talk about the calculation order and how you can control that. And we'll also look at adding calculations to both the where and the order by clauses of your select statements. We'll look at a couple of different ways to divide numbers and get different results, how to concatenate values to put multiple bits of information together into a single bigger piece of text, what happens when your expressions generate errors, and how we can format expression results to make the final results look a bit neater. So let's get started. If you've been following along with this series so far, you'll be fairly familiar with the basic setup by now, so you may prefer just to skip ahead to the next chapter of the video. If this is the first video you've seen in this series, here's a quick look at the basic setup. We've got a macro-enabled workbook which allows us to run a query by clicking the fairly obviously labelled button, and when we do that it's going to extract some information from a separate Excel file called Movies. The Movies workbook contains several worksheets and tables, with lots of information about a variety of films. I'm going to keep the Movies workbook open for the duration of the video, but that's just to make it easier for me to point out which bits we're talking about as we go through the video. You're welcome to close down the Movies file, and all of the code will still work. I've got both of these files stored in the same folder, and I'll stick a link in the video description so that you can download these and follow along and write the code yourself if you'd like to. A lot of the code that I've already written in the Basic Calculated Columns workbook relies heavily on Microsoft ActiveX data objects. Now, ActiveX Data Objects isn't the focus for this series, we're concentrating on the SQL side of things. But if you are interested in learning how to connect to a closed Excel file, we have a separate playlist. And again, I'll stick the link to this playlist in the video description. And I'd recommend starting with this video here, how do I get data from a closed Excel file using VBA, if that's the part you're interested in. Just to briefly show you the basic code I've already written in the Basic Calculated Columns workbook, heading into the Visual Basic Editor, when we click our Run Query button it triggers this basic subroutine which simply constructs a string representing our SQL query. That then gets passed into a separate subroutine which deals with all the complicated stuff such as establishing the connection to the closed Excel file and then returning a set of records. It does that by setting the source property of a record set using the SQL query that we've written. All of the rest of the code in there basically deals with writing the contents of the record set out into a new worksheet and tidying things up with a bit of error handling code thrown in there for good measure as well. As I say, I've already set a reference to the ActiveX Data Objects library, so if I head up to the Tools menu and choose References, you can hopefully see in here I've referenced the Microsoft ActiveX Data Objects 6.1 library. Just to demonstrate that the code works, if I head back to my menu sheet and click the Run Query button, it extracts a brand new worksheet or creates a brand new worksheet, extracting all the information from the Film sheet in the Movies workbook. We'll be writing quite a few queries in this video, so if you want to tidy things up from time to time, please feel free to click the Delete All But Menu Sheet button, and that will delete everything except for the menu sheet. Let's start with the absolute basics of how we add extra columns to the output of a query without selecting them from an existing source, such as the film worksheet. To do that we need to know where to define our extra columns, and the basic rule is if you want to see a column appear in the output of your query, you must define that column in the SELECT list of your SELECT statement. So to make this work, if we head back to our SELECT list, we've only got one item in there currently, the asterisk there represents every single column from the film worksheet. To add an extra column I can type in a comma, and then define the value that I want to see appear. The value you want to appear in a, an extra column can be as simple as a basic number. If I type in the number 123, that will generate a column where every single row contains the value 123. And just to demonstrate that that works, if I head back to my menu sheet and run my query, I get a, a, a basic expression that's evaluated for every single row of my query, but because it's just a simple number, it presents the exact same value. If we wanted to produce some text rather than a number, let's head back to the Visual Basic Editor. After the number 123 I can type in a comma, and then I have a couple of different delimiter characters I can use for text. Let's say I wanted to put the word wise owl in my string, or in my query output. I could use double double quotes, or I can use single apostrophes, which is the technique I prefer. 
Similarly, we could add an extra date as well, a column of dates if I type in another comma. Dates need to be enclosed in hash symbols or pound symbols. And there are several different date formats you can use. I'm gonna go with a standard one that we've talked about in a previous video using an international standard, the ISO 8601 standard for date formatting. So I'm gonna go with 2021-05-25 because that's today's date. Okay, so having done that, if I head back to my menu sheet and run that query again, I will have added three extra columns to my select list. And these column values are generated when the query runs. They're not extracted from an existing table. Now, apart from the fact that these three extra columns are pretty much pointless, they just show the same value in every single row. I have a couple of other problems with them as well. First of all, we only get these generic system generated column headers. I'd like some nicer names for my columns. Secondly, my new columns appear to the left of the existing ones, whereas I'd prefer to see them at the right. Let's sort out the column headers first of all. We can do that just by assigning an alias to each of the columns that we've just created. We've covered aliases in a previous video, but just as a very quick reminder, after the number one, two, three, I can write the word as, followed by the name I would like my new column to have. Best practice is to enclose your names, your identifiers in square brackets, just in case you use spaces or unusual punctuation characters. Here I'm just gonna say, this one's gonna be called my number with a space in between, so it will need the square brackets. After the wise owl text, I'm gonna say as, and then say my text. And then after the date, I'll say as my date. Not very inventive column names, but nonetheless, slightly better than the generic system generated ones. So having done that, if I head back to the menu sheet and run that query again, we now get some slightly better column names at least. To control the position of our new columns, we just need to be a little more precise about how we select the other columns in our query. Heading back to the Visual Basic Editor, rather than just saying select asterisk, select all of the columns, I want to say select all of the film tables columns. And to do that, I can precede the asterisk with a reference to the table that all those columns belong to. So I'm going to say rather than just select star, I'm going to say select film dollar inside a set of square brackets, followed by a full stop, then the asterisk. So we're using the asterisk as a property of the film table. It doesn't seem very natural to do this in a query which only involves one single table in your from clause. When we start bringing in multiple tables in the same query, it will become a little more natural to specify which table your columns come from. And in this case, having done that, if we head back to the menu sheet and then run the query again, we'll see this time our new columns appear to the right hand side. Now, when we start referencing multiple columns in our select lists, it's going to be very tedious writing out the name of this table in front of every single column we write. So rather than just using the full table name, you can assign an alias to the table. Heading to the end of my select statement, just after where it says from film dollar, in the same way that we assign a new name to a column, we can assign a new name to a table by saying as, and then make up a very short, succinct name to describe your table, give it a nickname. I tend to use single letters for my table aliases, usually the initial of the table name, so as f you can wrap up the letter in some square brackets, but it's entirely unnecessary. It's highly unlikely that that one single letter will contain either a space or a punctuation character. So you're welcome to leave the square brackets off your table aliases. It's a matter of preference. You can include them if you like, it will make no difference. And then rather than saying film dollar dot star, we can just say f dot star instead. If I could spell f, <laughs> that, that is. Okay, so f dot asterisk. Then if I head back to my select list, uh, beg pardon, my menu sheet and run my query, I get the exact same list of results now with the extra columns at the right hand side, but with a slightly shorter query to write. And this becomes ever more useful when you want to refer to multiple columns from the same table. So like, let's say rather than selecting every single column from the film table, I want to select the title column. So I can say f dot title followed by a comma and then f dot runtime followed by another comma and f dot budget 
and another comma and let's say f dot box office so you can hopefully see from this that it's much better to use a single alias a single letter alias rather than having to say film dot title film dot runtime etc anyway just to demonstrate that that query will work if we head back to the menu sheet again run the query we get a specific list of columns we've chosen from our film worksheet, as well as our three additional expression columns. From this point on, we're going to be adding quite a lot of extra calculated columns to our select list. And because I don't want to have to keep on scrolling left and right, I'm going to take some time to tidy up the layout of my query. I'm going to make the layout a little more like that I showed you on the slide earlier on, where we have the main keywords of our select statement on separate lines and our list of columns on separate lines as well. We've talked about this idea in previous videos, and if you're happy doing that, feel free to skip ahead to the next chapter of the video. You're not going to miss much other than me editing the layout of my query. But just in case you haven't seen that, here's the, the basic outline. I'm going to use space underscore continuation characters to allow me to break this single string onto multiple different lines. So I'm going to start by taking the entire query down onto a separate line. And then after the space, after the select keyword, I'm going to close some double quotes and then concatenate uh, a continuation character onto the next line. And then I'm going to hit the tab key to indent that line one space, open up some double quotes and then type in a space there as well. Now I'd like to put each extra column on a separate line. And that means I mean I need to make a decision about where I put my commas. Do we put commas at the end of the line after a column name, or do you include them at the beginning of the next line? Again, something we've talked about in previous videos, I'm going to do what I normally do and include my commas at the beginning of the next line, which I appreciate some people hate, um, but it doesn't matter. The query still works the same way. And um, this is entirely your personal preference. I'm going to close some double quotes after F dot title and then concatenate a continuation character. And then on the next line, I'm going to open up some double quotes and then I'm just going to take away that additional space after the comma there. Then I'm going to continue doing that with my other columns. So I'm going to concatenate a continuation character, begin a new um, double quote on the next line and take away the extra space. And then one more uh, um, existing column from the select list or from my film table, the box office. Now at this point, I don't want these extra three useless columns. We want to start building up to some actually useful expressions. So I'm just going to take away the um, the three, one, two, three, wise owl and date columns. Let's take those away entirely. And then after a space, after the final column, box office, close the double quotes and concatenate another continuation character. Now on this line, the from keyword, I want to take back one space. So I'm going to backspace the tab that I included earlier and then open up some more double quotes. And then I'm going to put the from keyword on its own separate line. And I'm going to break this again with another continuation character and then indent the table name and open up some more double quotes there. OK, so quite a lot of messing around to get that to be laid out neatly, but that allows us a much easier time of things when we want to include extra calculated columns in our select list. Just to check that all this still works, um, that I haven't messed anything up in terms of the syntax, if we put this entire string back together again onto a single continuous line, it should look exactly the same. So if I headed back to my menu sheet and run my query again, we'll get the four columns we've asked for from our film worksheet. And at this point, I'm just going to take the opportunity to tidy things up with the delete button to get back to a fairly empty workbook. And then we can start looking at how to add some actually useful calculations to our select statements. Let's begin our calculations with some nice simple arithmetic. We have a fairly standard range of arithmetic operators that we can use in our SQL queries. So we can add, subtract, multiply, divide in a couple of different ways, depending on whether we want to return a decimal or an integer, uh, the correct to raise things to the power of, and the mod operator to return the remainder of a division. We'll see most of these before the end of the video. Let's begin by multiplying the runtime field by 60 so that we can work out the runtime in seconds rather than its current value of minutes. 
To do that, we need to insert a new column. I want to, this new column to appear in between the runtime and the budget columns. So I'm going to add an extra blank line in between those columns and then begin another string with some double quotes, a comma, refer to the f dot runtime field. Of course, I could have just copied that and then multiply that if I use the correct closed bracket symbol at least, multiply that by the number 60. The spaces either side of the operator there aren't actually necessary. It will work without the spaces. I prefer the spaces there just to make it easier to read. Once I've done that, I can close the double quotes at the end of the expression and I can then concatenate another continuation character to bring everything back together again. It would be nice to have an extra column heading or a nice column heading rather than the generic EXPR system generated ones. So after the multiplied by 60, I can say as, and then in some square brackets, provide my new identifier or my new alias, let's say runtime seconds. Having done that, let's also divide the runtime by 60 so we can get the runtime in hours rather than in minutes. Here I am gonna copy and paste this expression I've just written, provide a new line, paste that expression in, and then simply divide the runtime by 60 rather than multiply by. I'm using the forward slash character there to make sure I get a decimal result. I can't have two aliases with the same name in the same query, so let's update the second alias to say runtime hours. Okay, having done that, we can head back to our menu sheet and run our query again. And we've got a couple of new columns generated with nice column headings, multiplying the value of runtime by 60 and dividing the value of runtime by 60 for the runtime hours column. Next, let's work out the profit for each film by subtracting the budget from the box office. So once again, we can head back to the Visual Basic Editor and I'm just going to start by copying the F dot box office line. So everything from the open double quote to the underscore character at the end. I can then paste that in on the next line. And after that, I can subtract from the box office the value of the budget field, which again, I can either copy and paste or just type in again myself. I'll assign an alias to that. So let's say as, and then I'll call that one profit. And then if I head back to the menu sheet and run that query again, we'll get a new column at the end, calculating the difference between budget and box office. Now let's take this calculation a step further and work out the profit margin. Just in case you're not sure, I'll briefly show you a quick Wikipedia article which explains how profit margin gets calculated. So we want to take the revenue minus the cost, which in our case is the box office minus the budget, divided by the revenue or the box office in our case. So we've already done the revenue minus cost to work out the net profit for the film. We now just need to divide that by the revenue. So let's head back to the Visual Basic Editor. I'd like to keep my existing profit column, so I'm just going to copy that entire line and then paste it in at the end of my select list. I'll change the alias at this point to say profit margin rather than just profit. I know I can't have two aliases with the same name. And then after I've subtracted budget from box office, I want to divide the result once again by the box office. So I'll just copy and paste that rather than type it in again. Now the calculation will work, it will generate a list of results, but it won't be the right results. Let's just have a quick look back at the menu sheet. If we run our query again, it's giving us a value that's virtually no different to the actual box office. There's a minute difference you might be able to see in some cases with some decimal places that's been added, but it's definitely not the, uh, the values we would expect. The reason this happens, as you may have already predicted, is that when you write multiple operators in the same expression, SQL uses the same calculation order rules as Excel and VBA. So it follows either bottomless or pedmus rules depending on your perspective. So either brackets and orders, or parentheses and exponents before division and multiplication, before addition and subtraction. So in our case, we're actually dividing the budget by box office and then subtracting the result from the box office. So that minute discrepancy is because of the very small um, value generated by dividing budget by box office. We want to make sure that box office has budget subtracted first and then the result of that gets divided by the box office. 
And to do that, you can use brackets or parentheses, depending on your preferred terminology. So I'm going to wrap up the box office minus budget in some round brackets, and then divide the result of that by the box office to get the profit margin. Heading back to the menu sheet and running that query once more, we now get a somewhat more sensible result. It's not formatted particularly nicely, but we'll talk about formatting a little bit later on in the video. Now we could have solved this particular problem in a slightly easier way here, just by referring back to the previous calculated column using its alias, profit. So rather than saying f.boxoffice minus f.budget, we could have replaced that with a reference to the column which already calculates that value. Now it's really important that we don't say f.profit here. The profit column doesn't belong to the table known as f, so there is no profit column in the film table. This would cause a problem. But if we just say profit, the alias itself, head back to the menu sheet and run that query again, it works perfectly happily. Now this will be something completely unnatural and wrong, akin to witchcraft if you come from a background in SQL uh, in a different dialect such as Transact SQL in Microsoft SQL Server, you definitely can't reference a column alias in a subsequent expression in your SQL select statements. But with the ADODB SQL dialect and the particular provider we're using to connect to an Excel workbook, this works perfectly happily. It gets even, perhaps even slightly stranger than that. It doesn't really matter which order you write your columns in, as long as the profit column is defined somewhere in this select list. I could happily take that column away entirely and just get rid of the extra blank line. And I could place this, I don't know, let's say randomly after the runtime column, referring to the profit column, which is defined all the way down here. If I head back to my menu sheet and run that query again, it still works perfectly happily. So as long as there is an alias that defines the value of profit somewhere in the select list, that query will work. I'm just going to undo this a few times just to get back to a sensible layout, I think. So a sensible layout will be profit first and then the column which uses the value of profit, I think. Now, although you can use a column alias in other columns defined in the same select list, you can't use that alias in other parts of your query. So for example, if I wanted to include a WHERE clause to show all the films where the profit is at least 1 billion, let's add an extra WHERE clause to our query. So at the end of the FROM clause, after I've aliased my table, I'll add a space there and then concatenate a continuation character. And on the next line, write the word WHERE and then leave a space after the word where and concatenate another continuation character. And then on the next line, indented one space, I'd like to try to refer to the profit alias. So I'll say profit greater than or equal to a one followed by nine zeros for one billion. Now, if I try to run that query from my menu sheet, I'll find that that will fail. I can't reference that profit alias in the where clause. So in this case, I will need to head back to the query and reproduce the basic expression which subtracts budget from box office. Rather than write that out again, I'm just going to copy it from my select list and then I'll place that in, in place of the reference to the profit. If you like, you can use parentheses or round brackets to enclose the expressions in the WHERE clause. It's not necessary in this case. If I head back to my menu sheet and I run that query again, it now does work to show all the films which made a profit of at least a billion dollars. We'll see a similar effect if we try to use an alias in the order by clause as well. Let's try to sort our list so that the film with the highest profit margin sits at the top. If we head back to the Visual Basic Editor, once again at the end of the WHERE clause I'm going to add an extra space and then concatenate a continuation character and then on the next line add in my ORDER BY clause with a space at the end and then concatenate an extra continuation character and on the next line indented one space. Let's say we wanted to try to just sort in descending order of profit margin. If I just copy that alias and say I want it in descending order, of course this isn't going to work. This is the opposite behaviour to that you'd expect in something like uh, Transact SQL in SQL Server. Uh, in this case you could have referenced this column alias here and the ordering would work, but with ADODB and this particular provider we'll find that this doesn't work. 
if I head back to my Visual Basic Editor, and what I'll do this time is try to replicate the expression used to calculate our profit margin. You may be able to spot an obvious problem here. Profit divided by box office. If I head back to my menu sheet and try to run the query, nope, because I'm still referring to a column alias. So I have to strip this all the way back to the original calculation. So I'm gonna take my box office minus budget instead of profit. And I do need to make sure that that is evaluated in the correct order. So I can wrap a set of round brackets around box office minus budget, divided by box office in descending order. And finally, having done all of that, I'll get my results in the order I want, finding that Minions has the highest profit margin of any film making at least a billion dollars. Now it may seem a little annoying having to repeat the same calculations in multiple parts of your select statement, but the one advantage it does give us is that we can both apply criteria to our query and sort the results of the query without having to display the values that we've calculated. So in this case, we could happily take away the profit and profit margin columns from the select list. I'm just going to highlight those two lines and cut them and get rid of the extra blank line that's appeared there as well. And we can still get the same set of results because the calculations are contained within both the WHERE clause and the ORDER BY clause. So heading back to our menu sheet, we can run that query again, get the same results but without having to display the extra columns we've calculated. Next, let's have a quick look at different ways to divide numbers. I'm just going to take the WHERE clause and the ORDER BY clause away from my existing query and don't forget to get rid of the extra ampersand and continuation character there from the end of the FROM clause as well. Now we already have one division in this select list already, dividing the runtime by 60 to get the runtime in hours. Let's just have a quick reminder of what that looks like. If we run the query, we get the decimal result of dividing the runtime number by 60. So Jurassic Park 126 comes out as 2.1 hours. The other symbol you can use to divide one number by another, if I just copy and paste my existing division so we can compare the two, is the backslash character rather than a forward slash. I'm just going to change my alias from runtime hours to say runtime hours integer, and that gives you a clue as to what's about to happen. So when you divide using a backslash character rather than a forward slash, you simply get the integer portion of that division. So if I run the query, I get not 2.1, just the number two. It's important to realize you are getting just the integer portion. It's not really technically rounding up or down. It's just ignoring the decimal component entirely. If we look at Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, which had a runtime hours of 1.9, it just returns the whole number portion of that number, which is just the number one. It's Nice to combine this with the mod or modulo or modulus operator so that we can get the remainder of the division that doesn't fit neatly into dividing the runtime by 60. So for Jurassic Park, I'd want to see the remainder of six additional minutes that don't divide neatly into whole hours. So heading back to the Visual Basic Editor, I could once again copy and paste the previous column and then rather than using a forward slash or a backslash character, replace that with the word mod. So this will divide runtime by 60 and return the remainder of that division. So let's call this one something like runtime remaining minutes. And then if we head back to the menu sheet and run that query one more time, that's what we'll get, the remaining minutes that don't divide neatly into whole hours. Rather than showing these calculated values in separate columns, we could put them all together to form a larger piece of information by concatenating them. Just to start with a slightly simpler example of concatenation, let's say we wanted to show, as well as the film's title, the name of the person who directed it. So after the f.title column name, if I wanted to concatenate something using ADODB and this particular provider, we use the ampersand symbol for concatenation exactly the same as we do in VBA and in Excel as well, but not the plus operator, which you may be familiar with from other dialects of SQL. So if I wanted to concatenate a piece of literal text, I can open up some single quotes and I'll add a bit of text that says was directed by. I'll attempt to spell that correctly as well. 
I've deliberately left a space before the word was and after the word by, so that when I form the complete sentence by concatenating next to the director, I can refer to the director field. When I run that query from the menu sheet, I'll see that I get the space after the film name and before the director name. So that's basic concatenation. But you can also concatenate the results of expressions together. So let's head back to the Visual Basic Editor. And let's say after I've concatenated the runtime in hours as an integer, I want to concatenate the letter H to the end of that. So if I go just after the number 60 there before my alias, I can concatenate the letter H in a set of single quotes. Just to demonstrate what that will look like if I head back to the menu sheet and I run that query, that simply puts the letter H after every single number. What I'd then like to do is include a space after the letter H and then concatenate that with the value of the runtime in remaining minutes. Now I could just reference that column, that the alias that I've created here, of course, as we saw earlier on, but the aim here is to make sure that these separate columns are formed into one single column. So instead, I'm just going to copy and paste the expression runtime mod 60. And then I can concatenate to the end of that, the letter M in some single quotes. I could, if I preferred as well, wrap a set of round brackets around each individual bit of the expression just to make it perhaps a little easier to read. The, the end result will be generated correctly anyway in this case. The, uh, the operation order is correct, but just to make it a little easier to read. I'm then just going to get rid of the additional runtime mod 60 expression and delete that extra blank line. And I'll just change the alias to say runtime hours mins. Okay, so having done all that, if I head back to the menu sheet and run that query again, I get those two separate columns combined into a single one with some additional text in there to make it a bit more readable as well. For the next example, I'd like to include an extra couple of columns in the select list, and I'd also like to tidy the select list up a little bit. So I'm just going to start by getting rid of the and was directed by and director, so that I've only got the film title. And I'm also going to get rid of the entire column, which calculates the runtime in hours and minutes, as well as the one that calculates the runtime in seconds as well. That's a little bit neater and tidier then at this point. The extra couple of columns I wanted to include were the Oscar nominations and the Oscar wins. So heading back to the end of my select list before my from clause, I can include an extra couple of columns here. So F dot nominations, and then make sure that I've concatenated that with a continuation character. When you're building a comma separated list of column names, there's no need to leave the extra space, by the way. You can happily, as we've been doing here, um, concatenate or just build together each extra column name after the comma. There's no requirement for the extra space. The extra space does no harm, but just to keep things uh, a little more consistent, I'm just gonna get rid of that extra space there as well. And then on the next line, I want to make sure I've included the F dot Oscar wins. I'll attempt to spell that correctly as well. And then I can leave the extra space at the end of the final column. It's worthwhile leaving the extra space there in case you're not using square brackets around your column name or your alias. If there were no square bracket there, when this line would be concatenated with the next line, the word wins and the word from would be joined together into a single word and the query would not be able to work out what each bit means. So here I think it is valuable to leave a space after the final column. So I can then concatenate that with a continuation character and then just to check the results of all of that, if we head back to the menu sheet and run the query again, we get our extra two columns. The reason I wanted to include these extra two columns is because I'd now like to work out the win ratio for our films. I want to divide Oscar wins by Oscar nominations. So Jurassic Park will win 100% of its nominations, whereas King Kong will only win 75% of its. So to do that, we can head back to the Visual Basic Editor and then we can concatenate or uh, include a new column. Let's start with 
the Oscar wins column. Now that space at the end of that line is no longer necessary, so we could take it away just for consistency. And then I would like to divide that by F dot nominations. So I can just copy and paste that column name and then provide an alias, let's say as win ratio. So you might think you'd be able to predict what might happen here. The, the reason I've brought in these columns is because the nominations contain zeros. Not every film has been nominated for Oscars. And if you were to try to divide a number by zero in Excel or in Transact SQL in, um, in Microsoft SQL Server, this would cause a problem. But 8ODB is a little more forgiving than that. You can hopefully clearly see that anywhere where it's possible to calculate the ratio, that answer has been returned correctly. But any row that would have generated an error by dividing by zero simply produces a blank or a null in the output. You can see this same effect with a range of different expressions you can write. Whenever the expression would return an error, you don't get an error, you get a blank or a null instead. Just to demonstrate that, let's try to do a couple of completely nonsensical things. I'd like to add the film title to the runtime in minutes. And hopefully you can tell just by looking at the values we can see. If I try to add Jurassic Park arithmetically to the number 126, that's clearly not going to work. But in ADODB with this particular provider, rather than seeing an error, we just get an empty result instead. So let's try to add that calculation to our results if we include an extra column and then concatenate a continuation character to the end of that. We could say f dot title. And I could of course have just copied and pasted these, but as I've started typing, why not? I'll just continue f dot title plus f dot runtime. The, com the capitalization there doesn't matter, but I'd like it to be consistent. And we can provide an alias for that. Let's call it uh, title plus time. So if we also add an order by clause to this query, just to demonstrate that it can sometimes work, I'll add another continuation character to the end of the from clause and then bring back my order by clause. And I'll make sure that I've ordered this query by the title column in ascending order. Ascending, of course, is the default but I'm going to indicate that explicitly there. If we head back to the menu sheet and run that query again, we'll see that where this result or where this expression can generate a result, it does actually work. So where the film title is a number and the runtime, of course, is always a number, it can add those two numbers together and produce a result. But where it's a piece of text added to a number, that just returns an empty or a blank or a null. So also on top of this, you can see that it's implicitly converting data types for you. This is something, again, that will be a little unnatural to people coming from a Transact SQL background where you have to almost explicitly force conversion of data types whenever you want it to happen. Here, ADODB and this provider is happy to perform the conversion for us automatically. Let's just do one more quick example of that. I'm going to add an extra couple of columns to the same select list. Let's include the F dot certificate field. And I'll then concatenate another continuation character there. And then I'd like to multiply the film title by the certificate. So in fact, let's do a little bit of copying and pasting here. So F dot title multiplied by F dot certificate and I'll give that an alias as title multiply, multiplied by certificate. And don't forget the continuation character at the end of that line. So like this. All right, a completely nonsensical example, I appreciate, but just to demonstrate that you can write a huge variety of basic expressions without fear of generating errors. The errors just get presented to you as blank or null or empty cells. And where the expression can produce a sensible result, it will automatically do so. For the final part of the video, I just want to talk briefly about ways we could improve the appearance of our query results.
For this particular example, where we're writing our query results into an Excel worksheet, I wouldn't do this in the SQL code at all. I'd rely on Excel's formatting features once we've extracted everything from our record set. In fact, I've already created a video and included some code in this workbook that does some basic formatting. So if you have a look back at the playlist I mentioned earlier on, if you're interested in how ActiveX data objects works, there's a bit of uh, there's a video there that explains how you can detect the data type of columns in a record set and then apply a format to the Excel worksheet afterwards. And I've got some of that code actually included in the get query results subroutine. It runs a quick check to see if the field is a date data type, and if so, it applies a specific date format to that column. So you can use similar techniques once you've got your data out of the record set itself. Just in case you did want to format things, maybe you're providing your query results to populate maybe a drop down list on a user form or something like that, where you don't have quite so easy options to apply formatting. Let's start with a nice simple example. I want to format the runtime hours so that it's formatted to two decimal places. I'm just going to head back to the Visual Basic Editor and back up to the top of our um, module. I'm just going to tidy up a couple of these additional um, columns. Let's get rid of the title multiplied by certificate, the certificate and the title plus time columns. They're a bit silly. Let's get rid of those entirely and get rid of the extra blank line that appears there as well. So after the runtime divided by 60 line, let's just copy that entire line and paste it in immediately below. I'm going to pass the result of that expression into a function that, again, you may have encountered in VBA before. It's called round. Now the round function takes a number and then allows you to specify how many decimal places you want to round that number to. So I'm going to put in the number two after a comma before I then close the round brackets. And then let's just change the name of the alias runtime hours to because I can't think of a more inventive name for it than that. And then if we head back to the menu sheet, I'll just quickly tidy things up first, run the query. We'll see we get our original runtime hours and then the runtime hours rounded to two decimal places. Now let's do something similar for the win ratio column. I want to format this as a percentage with two decimal places. So to do that, I can head back to the Visual Basic Editor. And once again, I'm just going to copy and paste the existing column. So I've got the original one to compare it with. For this one, I'm going to use another function rather than rounding. I'm going to use a function called format percent. It's a fairly sensible name for this function based on what it does. It formats the number you pass into it as a percentage. And there's a second optional parameter which allows you to specify how many decimal places you'd like. So after I've divided Oscar wins by nominations, I can type in a comma and then say two, close the round brackets. And once again, another inventive name for this column, win ratio two. If I head back to the menu sheet and run that query again, I'll get an extra column with that value formatted as a percentage. Now you might notice in this case, Excel tells you that these values in these cells aren't actually numbers any longer. They're numbers formatted as text. So one downside to formatting things using the format functions in your SQL queries is that the numbers don't come out as numbers, so you couldn't apply further calculations to them quite so easily in Excel. They're returned as text values instead. We can do something similar to format the budget and box office columns as currency. And we have a couple of options for how we can do that. Let's start by using the built-in format currency function and see what effect that has on the budget column. So in front of budget, I can say format currency, open some round brackets, and then close the round brackets after budget. Now, because the budget column is part of an expression, that's going to change the column name to the generic EXPR1000. So I want to apply an alias to this. I want to give it its original name. So I'm just going to say as budget so that it doesn't look as though the name of that column has changed at all. If we head back to the menu sheet and run that query, we will indeed see that the budget column has been formatted as currency. But unfortunately for me, because of the regional settings of my computer in the UK, I'm using pound symbols rather than US dollars, which is what these figures actually are. 
So let's see what we can do about that with a box office column. Rather than using the built-in format currency function, we can use the slightly more generic format function. So we can say format, open some round brackets, and then after the reference to the box office column, we can type in a comma, and then in some single quotes, we can write out our own custom format string. So if I wanted to uh, start this with a dollar sign, I can type in a dollar sign followed by a hash symbol. If I want to make sure that my sets of three digits or my thousands get separated with commas, I'll need to type in a comma followed by two more hashes and a zero. If I wanted decimal places, I could type in a full stop and a couple of decimal places, but I think I don't want decimal places in this case, so I'll leave those off. After the closed single quote, I can then type in a close round bracket and say as box office, my alias to give it its original name. And then if I head back to the menu sheet and run that query again, I'll see that the box office is formatted as a currency value, but using dollar symbols rather than pound symbols. So there we go, some basic information about generating calculated columns in your SILAC statements. Over the course of the next few videos, we're going to go into some more detail about specific calculation types. So we'll look at conditional expressions using the if and switch functions. We'll look at how to deal with nulls in your expressions and also how to work with text and how to work with dates. So I hope you're looking forward to those videos. Thanks very much for watching this one. See you next time.